Hello, everyone. I am so excited to finally get to share my dream dress project with you. This was the dress that I had purchased fabric for for my elevation to the Order of the Laurel within the SCA. And it's a gorgeous silk jacquard that I used in place of silk brocade. I was actually on my way to film the reveal footage for this dress when I fell down the stairs and broke my leg in 2022. So it's about time that I got out there and filmed the reveal footage so that I could share the project with all of you. Thank you so much for your support while I've been getting this project up and running. To dive right into this project, I did the pad stitching for my bodice pattern, which I've been using for several of these dresses. It follows the same pattern I used for my black Roman Widows outfit that you saw earlier this year on this channel. If you haven't seen that video, I'll go ahead and link it below. There are going to be some steps on this garment that are really similar to other 16th century style projects that I've done. So I'm going to link the playlist for my 16th century how-tos and tutorials, dress diaries, all of that down in the description and in the end card for this video. So you can always feel free to check that out and see if there's other videos that fill in some of the gaps. For my long-term viewers, I didn't want to have you watch the same explanation over and over again. Um, thank you so much for watching as I get through this project. For those of you who are new around here, though, in the 16th century, a lot of the bodices were flatlined. So I built the internal guts of this dress, including a layer of canvas and a bunch of wool for padding. And I pad stitched that together to create a foundation layer. That canvas and wool foundation for the bodice is actually what gives it its structure and support. That and a bit of tailoring, if we're being honest. And the step that I'm doing right now is taking my fashion fabric and basically doing some whip stitches to secure it to that shell so that it holds the body of that lighter silk jacquard that I'm using for this dress. Trying to get the corners clean with any of these dresses when I'm going around into the armpits and the edges where there's going to be lacing can be a little bit tricky. I end up just trying to keep the stitches as small and as non-invasive as humanly possible. That way, when I go to start working eyelets, I don't risk cutting a thread somewhere that I might want later. So even then, I'm sure I have at some point popped a thread on this internal stitching. Eyelid itself holds everything in place later, so no harm, no foul. These whip stitches don't actually have to go all the way through to the canvas layer. Most of my stitching is going through maybe one or two layers of that wool felt. Depending on the section of the bodice, it has different layers of that felt to help create that cone-like shape that was really popular in the latter half of the 16th century. This dress is inspired by one of the dresses worn by Eleanor of Toledo. I've done similar dresses to hers in the past again, but what makes this one really special to me is that I was trying to do it completely without underpinnings when I originally made it. Now through stress and losing weight or some other issues, 
I end up do needing to wear stays under this one in order to support my bust and avoid a strong line underneath the bust. But there are images where you can see that in some of the 16th century portraiture. So if that's a look or a mobility thing where you don't want to be wearing stays under it, by all means, do what you need to to wear the dress to your comfort level and to your aesthetic choices. For a little bit of consistency for my long-term viewers, most of this garment was constructed prior to me investing in my sterling silver thimble. So what you're seeing me wearing right here is also a Victorian thimble, but it's one that's called Her Majesty, it's brass. And this is the project that really inspired me to upgrade to that silver one just because I was starting to get little green rings around my finger while I was working on it from that thimble. I'm still more or less figuring out how to make all of the stitches work wearing a thimble still at this point. I would highly recommend for your own growth at some point as a sewist to try recording a couple of your projects and then go back and analyze that footage for technique at a later date. See how you've grown or just see what you can be doing better because it doesn't feel, didn't feel right at the time and it kind of looks awkward or you're trying to move your fingers in a way that fabric isn't doing what you wanted. It, it's really handy. While I finish stitching all of the fashion fabric to the inner lining on this bodice, let's kind of catch everybody up on what the SCA is since I reference it a lot in several of my videos, but I understand that not everyone in the costuming community might know what that is. The SCA is a living history version of a LARP, I guess you could say, in some regards, that was started back in the 1960s. It started out in Berkeley, California, here in the U.S., and since has grown to be an international group that focuses on study and sharing information about history prior to the 17th century. A lot of our membership will find specific time periods and cultures that they want to specialize in because they really love studying it. I spent a lot of time studying 16th century European fashion. Um, other people might find a specific country or a specific region and go deep, or they might find a particular hobby that they really love and they'll dive deep into that. So it's a really cool group. Um, if you're interested, I'm not officially sponsored by them, and, and as always, any opinions on this channel are my own. I'm not consulting with them about what I'm saying, but I do want it to be out there so that folks kind of understand what's going on. To catch up with what's going on in the video for this outfit, I am done doing all of the fashion fabric tacking and now I'm just cutting out the lining. I'm using the piece itself as my pattern and guide at this point because there may be a little bit of extra puff or a little bit of shrinkage. And that's going to be all based around what's going on with the pad stitching and the fashion fabric. I don't recommend trying to over tension your pad stitches on this particular time period. Unless you know what that shrinkage is gonna look like and you're planning for it when you're doing the piecing. 
because the edges of that lining are going to get tucked under and whip stitch in place, they're actually going to be set back in from the outer edge of the garment just a little bit. That's called a flat lining. And that means I can cut it to be the same size as the current finished garment without having to worry about adding more seam allowance because it'll already be built into what I'm doing. My favorite material for lining my skirts and my bodices is actually about a three and a half ounce linen. I'll link that down below, though that is not a sponsored link in the slightest. It's just the stuff I've been using for years and I have found I really enjoy it. It keeps me cool while I'm putting all of these layers into a garment. And at the same time, relatively speaking, it's not crazy expensive. Though if you're making one of these dresses yourselves, I have definitely at different parts of my sewing career used muslin or old bed sheets or what have you. So because this dress was meant to be worn at my elevation ceremony for the Order of the Laurel, I wanted to try and chase that historically accurate dream a bit. And so I stuck with period appropriate materials throughout the entire dress. To keep the bias on this from stretching strangely on me and not lining up the way I want, I'm pinning down the lining just inside the fashion layer. It's going to be the last layer that's seen, so it actually protects the edges of that fashion fabric that is on the outside of my garment. And I want to make sure that the fabric evenly covers both sides so I'm not starting on one side and I get all the way to the other side and it shifted strangely. It it happened to me at one point so now I always pin it down just to do that little bit of extra due diligence. It saves me a lot of time compared to having to rip everything else out like I did the last time. If these little curved areas at the back of your armpit or at the front aren't playing nice, you can clip the lining or the fashion fabric just a little bit inside that seam allowance. That will let the seams spread just a bit more so that you can get the curves and the bias to go around in the way that you want. It's not always necessary for every fabric weave but it's a tool to keep in your toolbox just in case. The linen is a relatively open weave right now, even with me having pre-washed it and shrunk it. So it's doing more or less what I want it to do without clipping. But I believe that the silk did need a few snips added in and I just did not get that recorded for you. So while I finish pinning the lining into the fashion layer on my bodice, let's talk a little bit about the SCA laurels and peerages. So peerages and the SCA are high level awards for different disciplines that the group has. The laurel is gonna be for an art, science, research, things like that very specifically versus the Knights and the Masters of Defense are different types of martial activities. Pelicans do a lot of service. So depending on how long you've been playing and what your skill sets are, attaining that sort of commitment to the group as a whole and being recognized for that particular discipline may take a long time or a short time. It really is an individualized journey. Um, I think I'd been playing for about 15 years-ish, give or take, when I was offered to go and contemplate being added to the Order of the Laurel, which was a really big deal. And 
I'm really hoping that I can continue to help the group as a whole that has given me so much over the last 15 plus years of my life. When someone says yes, they do want to join those orders and be seen as a leader in the community in that way. Generally, you have what's called an elevation, which is a ceremony where you're promising to uphold the ideals of the society and overall be a good cookie. There is a little more to it than that, but I'm trying to keep this as like an easy newbie view of this for the folks that aren't in the SCA on my channel. So usually, depending on what your preferences are, you, you can do what I call the party in the dress method, which is what I'm working on right now. Some people just want to go through the ceremony and get right to work. And they already know it's going to be a solid yes, and they're going to do all the things. So because I kind of wanted the party in the dress mentality, I put to work making this gorgeous dress and it had in combination with this a lot of really great pieces that were made by people that I know love me very much and have supported me through my journey in personal growth and as an artist. If you are interested in seeing me do a get ready with me sort of getting dressed version of this dress from the skin out please comment down below and let me know that that's something you're interested in because there are some different accessories that go to this one versus some of my other outfits that I wore So for everyone else who has been sticking around just for purely the sewing, thank you for letting me go through those explanations for folks over kind of what inspired this dress and why it needed to happen and why it was on a bit of a time crunch, honestly. And I used a pre-existing pattern that I had rather than trying something new. Right here, I am pinning down my front bodice, just like I had done previously with my back. To the lining fabric, these bodices, if you're going based off of Eleanor of Toledo's funerary dress, were all in one piece. Although there are some clever spots where you could probably do some piecing should you pick out something that isn't quite right and you need to add in a panel somewhere or do some other interesting bits. So if you're curious on how I would add or subtract size and inches from this bodice pattern for someone, let me know down below and I'll see if I can get that uploaded. A few of you might have noticed that my shoulder straps actually don't go straight up and down. They're at a little bit of an angle. I've done a few mock-ups of this bodice over the years, and I have found that that particular angle works best for my shoulder shape to make sure that the shoulder straps are going to curve over my shoulder nicely. There are some versions of this I've made where it's one long bias strap that comes off of either the front or the back. I decided to try and split the difference to minimize yardage waste on this particular dress because I was limited on the yardage. I had purchased this fabric as kind of a dream fabric dress situation many years prior and I needed to make sure there was enough fabric to do the entire dramatic effect I was looking for. Okay. 
because I was also limited on fabric, I stuck to a very sturdy scissors down by 9 p.m. situation. It's a best practice that I picked up years ago where I know that I can sew till midnight. I've got the stamina for it most days still. But if I mess something up, I can always unpick it. It will be frustrating, but generally speaking, it's not the end of the world. Whereas if I miscut something, it can be harder to fix that. I might need to go and find new yardage or do piecing or something else. So yes, I'm hanging out in my fuzzy bathrobe, but it's not quite bedtime yet. To start pinning the lining into the front of the bodice, I did start at the center point at the bottom of this bodice and kind of folded and pinned that into place prior to me going through the rest of everything. That let me anchor the lining and the fabric together at a crucial matchup point, sort of like using notches in modern sewing, and work it out evenly from side to side. I didn't want to go all the way around one side necessarily and go back too much just because it can lead to weird stretching along these bias curves. The, this one at the waistline of the bodice, which kind of follows the waist down to a point near the, the hip line. Or when you're looking at the side seams, those are also on a slight bias or the shoulder straps, which also have just a slight bias. You wouldn't think 16th century, oh, look at all the bias cuts, but they're kind of subtle in there, to be honest with you. And there's me clipping those seams, just like I mentioned in the previous little section here. Building this dress took about five to six weeks to get everything done from start to end. That's making sure that I got my pad stitching done, doing these bits where I'm tucking the lining and the fashion layers around the inner lining, attaching skirt panels, all the hem, everything. I do have a day job and I definitely had a day job at the time of the original recording of this video. So I needed to work it in around that schedule, which meant I was sewing for about three to four hours a night when I got home from work and spent a lot of time like soup. Soup was my friend because it was cold outside and it was easy. So I don't often try to crank through a dress like this on that kind of a tight time frame, but I needed to make some choices and get the fabric and get everything assembled properly. By the time I started pinning and trying to tuck the corners in neatly on the bottom of the waistline, it was getting a little bulky. I, I did ultimately get it all pinned down nicely, but if it's causing headaches for you, you can cut out some of the excess in that corner and that will help everything lay flat and behave a little bit better for you. So you're not trying to shove an all through however many layers of fabric that is, and getting stuck when you go to do eyelets later.
If you've been paying really close attention to my pinning on the front and the back pieces, you might notice that I have not been doing any finishing work to the necklines at this point. I'm not tucking it or anything like that. And that's because I intend to do a different bound neck style that you actually see Eleanor wear in one of her reddish pink portraits and some of the other portraiture that she did, which means this dress is not washable, but because of the type of silk it is, it was never going to be washable anyway. To finish off the edges of the front and the back bodice, I am just whip stitching those layers together. If I choose to finish my bodice and my skirt separately, that way if there's ever a problem and someone steps on a train, it just pops a couple stitches of my skirt pleating and it doesn't try to rip up my entire bodice and cause further damage. That's a personal preference. There is some historical basis for it, but if you want to pleat your skirts into your fashion layer and then cover it with the lining or something, you do you. Next up, we need to go through and mark out the eyelets for the side lacing on the dress. Now, I prefer to do this with about an inch between the midpoints on each ring, and I am going to use iron rings that I put in to around the eyelet to reinforce it as I go through. This helps me tension the dress a little bit better, as well as there's evidence for it in the funeral dress for Eleanor of Toledo. In keeping with historical examples from this period, I'm going to do spiral lacing to do the side back seams on my dress. What that means is I'm going to have two rings that are really close to each other, and the lacing rings are gonna be offset just slightly, so I can almost do a whip stitch through the pre-marked holes that are reinforced with rings for my eyelets to try and keep everything exactly where I want it. In retrospect, I don't really like using just this piece of chalk because it doesn't give me nearly as clean a line. There are other ways that you can do this with other bits of chalk to make life easier on you. These aren't showing up as being offset in quite the way I wanted, but it does work for the dress when you see it on me. On most of my dresses, for Renaissance costuming, when I'm doing eyelets, I will use several strands of a cotton embroidery floss. But this time around, because of the type of event and occasion the dress is being made for, I sprung for a complementary silk embroidery floss from Splendor. It's in a light blue that picks up on the light blue in the jacquard. And I think I was using about three or four strands to that. It makes it so I can work this up a little bit faster than if I was just using sewing thread. And at the same time, it's also going to make it a little more durable as long as I wax it appropriately. Because silk fibers are really, really durable.
We do have an entire separate video that goes over how to do eyelets in three different historical ways, whether that is doing it without these rings in just a basic thread whip, which is completely historical. There's lots of examples of it. There's a version that uses a little bit of a tidy whip stitch, which at different points in history was also done. And then a additional one where I go over these rings and how to add them in. If you want that, that will be in the playlist down below. Or if you can kind of get the gist of how to do these rings from the footage I am going to include, then please do keep watching. Let me know if you have ever done your eyelets with these reinforcement rings like this. It's not as typically seen out there in the world from what I've seen, but it makes such a difference in my experience with how I'm able to get it to support a larger bust in this particular dress without always needing a set of stays underneath. Depending on the tightness of your fashion fabric, as well as the inner linen layers and other pieces, you may need to reopen those fibers and the hole that you pushed through with your awl. It doesn't happen with every single garment, so I'm going to say you need to use your best judgment over that particular situation, but you want to make sure that there's enough of a hole in an even way for you to get your needle through so that you can wrap your thread around the ring and kind of cinch everything down to those rings to keep the holes uniform. When I'm having friends lace me into dresses, they personally really enjoy it when I've done this because it makes it way easier for them to get me in and out and get the aglets through the different portions of my dress. The dresses where I haven't done this, they just find it a little more difficult and frustrating. So it might be something to keep in mind if you're asking people to help get you dressed versus able to kind of manipulate your shoulder back around to lace this up yourself. Once I finished my eyelets, there was just a little bit of bubbling between where the eyelets rest at the edge and the rest of the fashion fabric on the garment. It did get sucked up back in and the fibers retightened, tension got fixed, all of that. Once I sat down and I did a little bit of ironing, it also helped kind of smooth out a couple of these snags that you see where my needle or the all caught one thread in the brocade patterns. We are officially into the home stretch of trying to get this dress done, and I'm starting to run short on time. So I went and I took the bias binding that I cut out for the neckline and for my hem, and I did stitch it down with my machine on one side. And then on the inside to finish off that edge, I'm going to hand stitch that down into the lining and the interlining to give it a little bit of structure and stability. Again, this is here to bind off all of the curves that went into this neckline. And I also am going to do some pinking to it. So there's really two reasons that I did bias on this rather than straight grain. If I had done the straight grain, I could have fussed with it enough to get it to curve around my neckline and those strap curves. But when I went to go and pink or clip the edges of the neckline, they would have frayed out a lot more quickly. 
and needed to be replaced much more frequently than they will by me using a bias cut on my binding tapes. I hope that makes sense. If you want me to do a pinking and slashing video where I show you the different effects you can get with doing straight grain fabric versus bias prior to you doing cut work, please do let me know in the comments. I would love to do that video for you. I just haven't heard a lot of feedback with people wanting to see it. Because of the number of layers around the neckline of the bodice, I chose to use these little clips that I got for doing leather work and millinery work. It saved me from trying to run straight pins through all of these layers while I was trying to stitch things down. And ultimately, it also saved me from risking snags with a straight pin going sideways and catching more of the brocade or something on the inside. Frequently when I'm making garments, I'll use stitches that are just a little bit bigger than other people think you probably should be using for garment construction. This is one of the few times I actually did go back to those tiny stitches because I wanted to make sure that if it did potentially flop open, it was taken care of and it looked nice and neat for everything that I was working on. Do any of you have that one garment that you point to where your skills leveled up? And you can obviously say that, yes, this is the thing where I perfected doing XYZ. For me, this dress is where I went from being okay with the thimble and kind of figuring it out to being able to establish a really good rhythm and keeping my stitches even and consistent. Probably still use a thread that's longer than most people would like, but it works for me. Once I was done sewing the binding around the neckline, I used the same bias tape to bind off the bottom edge of my hem and same stitches, same tiny little stitches, trying to make sure that everything was secure and wasn't going to potentially pop and do some weird fraying stuff while I was walking around. I know that bias tape can be a little bit wasteful depending on how you're using it. So I wanted to throw out there that for my neckline, I did use some of the longest, most consistent pieces to sew that piece down. And then the shorter pieces are the more odd pieces that I was still able to sew into a continuous strip for use went on the hemline because there were way fewer people taking pictures and staring at my hem compared to the folks that were staring at my face and taking photos of me throughout the ceremony and afterwards. To get the pinked neckline on this dress, I just found a rhythm of about every quarter of an inch or so doing a tiny little clip with my dressmaking scissors because they were the sharpest pair I had at the time, all the way around that neckline. 
At first, when I cut, the cuts actually stayed pretty flat. There's very little fraying or any of that going on because of the bias cut of the binding, and that's what I wanted. What I didn't expect was that later down the road, those cuts would do just a tiny bit of fraying and would give a really cool feathered effect that you see in some existing garments for different bits of pinked fabric. Like I said a little earlier in the video, this particular seam treatment is not machine washable, not that the type of silk I'm using was itself. So just keep that in mind if you want to try this technique out for yourself. It's not going to be something you can just throw in the wash and let it go. And you might end up having to sign like a waiver or something with the dry cleaners if you want to take care of it that way. My intention for cleaning this dress is actually going to be spot cleaning it as they would have done in period and maybe a little bit of vodka water mix to deodorize it as needed. This may have been the most stressful part of doing the entire dress because after all of that sewing, to have to unpick this and redo the binding would have been heartbreaking. So I'm really glad that I did a little bit of practice on a sample and then went to town. Continuing it in my wintertime chic after work stuff to keep me comfy while I sew. We've got my lovely fox pajama bottoms and we're going to put the dress on the dress form to try and get the hems to match a loop. Everything has been sewn and I want to mark the bottom of my skirt to put a tuck in it the way the Pisa dress is done it, from the Medici exhibit that I had just gotten back from when I was making this dress. I was so enthralled by that dress, I figured I should try it. If you look really closely, you'll also recognize the two-tone lacing from my Lucette two-tone video. I'll link that down in the description as well if you're interested in learning how to make that particular Lucette pattern. It provided a really strong lace, and I think my laces are actually twice as long as they need to be. I would rather have that than have them break and not have enough, so that's why I'm just going to tuck in all the excess and try to mark out my hemline with all of that shoved in there. As you can see, the hem is actually intentionally about six or seven inches too long for what I would wear it at with a normal height. And that's because I'm trying to make sure I have enough to do the tuck that I'm trying to do. I didn't have a lot of success with putting it on my dress form in all honesty and trying to mark it out in this way. I don't know if other people have tried this method of marking tucks and had it be more successful for them. I just found it really difficult. Maybe it's the slippery nature of the silk I was using, the fact that it's got that massive train that kind of needs to have the tuck put in and molded and it's going to vary a little bit around the train to make the tuck happen. It Ultimately, I'm not going to lie, after I wore the dress the first time, I did cut about three or four inches off of the entire skirt. I saved that scrap in case I ever need it to do something with the hem again. And I redid this because I thought I was going to do an awesome train and it ended up being a little bit excessive for what I was doing.
Ultimately, after fighting with it for an entire evening on the floor, I opted to use my trusty old quilter's ruler to mark out from the bottom edge how deep I wanted that tuck to be and then go and pin it back in based on where it had touched the ground. This proved to be a little bit easier for me. I'm sorry if it's not making a ton of sense. Um, let me know if I need to do a better explanation video for doing these 16th century Italian skirt tucks. I can do a follow-up video where I try and do it again. I hadn't done it a lot before this project. So it was another one of my small stretch techniques I was doing on this particular dress. And I'm really interested in trying it again on another skirt at some point to try and make sure I've got it down a little bit better. basic thing I've been able to figure out is I figured out where the tuck should start and on my ruler and I put the ruler between the edge and where I wanted the tuck to start and then I pulled skirt down to land where I wanted the tuck to end on the ruler and I would pin at the top where there was a fold in the fabrics for the skirt and that gave me my inner fold that I was going to be sewing down for the tuck. I'm hoping that makes sense. Again, if you want me to do a specific tutorial on doing these skirt tucks, please let me know down in the comments. Unintentionally, it actually kind of matches up with the pattern pretty well in most places. So that was a fun side effect. And you can see this is the little crease where I'm going to whip stitch the skirt layers together while getting as little of the fashion fabric as possible. If this video has been helpful to you in any way on your personal sewing adventures, I would love it if you'd hit the like button to let the other viewers out on the platform as well as the algorithm know that it's been helpful. I would also love it if you'd subscribe and keep us around for more adventures. I have other fun videos in progress and a bunch of half edited projects I'm going to try to get up before the end of the year. So thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for engaging with the content and everyone else in the community. After all that work on the hem, I ended up not wearing the proper shoes underneath this dress just because of the filming location. It didn't feel especially safe to be wearing that particular pair of shoes that this dress was hemmed for. But in the future, there will probably be photos of me wearing the proper shoes and the dress just floating effortlessly where we want it to go. What dream dress projects do you have out in the world? Tell me about it down in the comments section and let's see if we can help each other get to those dream projects. Thank you again for watching and until next time, I hope you're having a fantastic day and check out the blooper reel at the end if you want to see some funny stuff. Bye. Okay, now I'm recording. <laughs> I'm gonna do that too, just so you know. It's already recorded, I started long before that.
Ready when you are. Alright. You actually can record it? I pushed record. Okay. <laughs>